I'll start with this uh, slide about uh, the rise of a new greater China. Um, this is something um, Harry Harding wrote uh, in a special issue of the China Quarterly convened at the beginning of 1993 in Hong Kong. I was actually uh, a discussant uh, for that particular workshop organized by the China Quarterly at that time. And my understanding was actually in the early 1990s with um, a few years approaching 1997, the so-called handover, um, a term that has been coined to describe whatever that happened uh, with Hong Kong becoming part of China. Um, and then uh, folks at China Quarterly were thinking about, okay, we need to you know, think about uh, what are the implications of all that? And then they wanted at first to do something on Hong Kong, but after much discussions, they decided that actually maybe it's not a story about Hong Kong, but a story about a much you know, broader uh, set of developments in the form of greater China. And then they then used that particular theme to focus on uh, what's going on and what's uh, likely to happen. And uh, that workshop, I think, resulted in a special issue in China Quarterly, and subsequently, I think, uh, there was a book uh, on that subject as well. Um, sort of looking back, I mean, first of all, of course, you know, this notion about greater China. What I, I would like to um, talk about and hopefully start a dialogue is to what extent this idea is actually no longer relevant, uh, or to what extent when we associate the word or the phrase greater China, we now would come up with something very different from what um, when people gather together at the beginning of the 1990s were thinking about when they talk about greater China. Um, and that, um, of course, you know, I, I put two coasts and three lands, uh, and one country, two systems, uh, all, all these, you know, these are terms and phrases that have been used to try to capture uh, the more ambivalent idea of what does it mean in terms of uh, the interactions and the uh, geographic, political, economic definition of the Chinese communities in mainland China, Taiwan, Hong Kong to some extent, Macau, and some people even, of course, extend that to include Chinese communities elsewhere, maybe in California, uh, British Columbia in Canada or somewhere, I mean, there are uh, 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 the Business Week, for example, talk about, of course, you know, part of Silicon Valley, you know, it's also, you know, an extension of greater China. But anyway, um, but in those days, um, when um, uh, people think about greater China, and uh, Harry Harding provided really, I think, one of the uh, best um, uh, analysis of the origin, the history, the debate, and how the term Greater China came about. And at the beginning of that article he wrote, in setting the scene and analyzing the various approaches and multiple <coughs> meanings of Greater China, he uh, started with this idea that suddenly Greater China as a term became really a, a popular phrase that seemed to have um, captured people's imagination and attention. So uh, the word Great China um, appeared in the headlines of all these newspapers, magazines, and everything. Um, and then, um, so he said, Great China joins other phrases like the New World Order, the end of history, Pacific century, and the clash of civilizations as part of the trendiest vocabulary used in discussions of contemporary global affairs. Now I think, uh, well, the new world order is always a term that we can use. You know, uh, there's always a new order, whatever uh, happens. The end of history probably has been rejected as an accurate description of post-Cold War international development. But, you know, it's with us, you know, it's a term that people still well, refer to quite often uh, Pacific century, you know, obviously, you know, we are probably 
uh, at the Pacific century, a clash of civilizations. Uh, even though Sam Huntington passed away recently, but still, you know, it's a, still a very major uh, phrase that we talk about all the time. Uh, but Greater China, to what extent is still sort of trendy, or is it now already probably forgotten as a relevant term? With China's rise as such a major, powerful country, economically, politically, uh, and some might even say, even you know, culturally. Um, so when we talk about Greater China now, first, maybe not too many people talk about it in at least not in the same context. Um, uh, people seem to be talking about Greater China. Maybe I, I is it better if I use this? Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. Right, okay. Um, things seem to have changed in terms of how we think about the notion of greater China. Um, this is how Harry Harding described uh, the evolution of the term as a popular expression, particularly in the media. Um, you know, the Economist, uh, he, he referred to the Economist, talking about Taiwan becoming part of the Greater China Confederation. Talk about the Business Week in 1988. Um, again, referred to uh, Greater China, three-way economic integration of Hong Kong, Taiwan, and the mainland. Well, even Los Angeles Times, I think, contributed to that um, in 1990, special sort of uh, uh, feature story referring to Greater China as a superpower on a drawing board. Um, basically referring to the economic integration and possible political reunification, but by 1997 and 1999, we have the political unification of Hong Kong and Macau. Um, Taiwan, of course, is a different story. Um, in some ways, uh, at least initially, in the 1990s, of course, relationship across the trade uh, between mainland China and Taiwan uh, really became rather turbulent. Um, but that was sort of the original, I think, uh, construct of uh, greater China. Now I don't know what you find if you search on Google, for example, for the word Greater China. I did that recently. Uh, none of those, those ideas that I discussed earlier, or those um, uh, sort of um, various things that uh, Harding uh, referred to, appeared on Google. Uh, this is one that I found, seizing global opportunities with unparalleled greater China strength. This is HSBC advertising for greater China fund. Uh, I don't know whether you are keen about investing in greater China funds and various other financial instruments, uh, particularly following the financial crisis. Uh, but if you do all the search, probably uh, investment vehicles, corporations, offices in China, or maybe Hong Kong, or in Taiwan, if they are business operations uh, in these three different places, then they usually would uh, refer themselves to be the Greater China Operation, Greater China Headquarters, and, and, and whatnot. Um, it partly, I think, probably uh, confirms the trend of the economic integration and business op operations uh, among Taiwan, Hong Kong, and mainland China. But it's probably also, in a way, this is basically in terms of the idea of greater China, it's no longer an idea of sort of something uh, like an entity, but really more operational activities. So the concept of greater China, that sort of you know um, uh, idea behind the original thinking of uh, uh, an interacting sort of dynamic emergence uh, 
um, of some uh, form of um, uh, sort of entity adding the strength of Hong Kong, Taiwan to that of mainland China and making China far more successful, influential, and probably um, with much greater uh, influence and presence around the world doesn't seem to be relevant anymore. Um, I was thinking about this actu actually, about whether Greater China is still relevant. Um, last year, when the um, mainland China and Taiwan signed this ECFA agreement, economic cooperation, um, and then I was invited to um, attend a forum at uh, the WTO uh, talking about the, the sort of you know, consequences and prospects. I'm not a Taiwan specialist. Um, I think I was there partly because you know, I was involved with a group that um, uh, would like to debate about free trade and regionalization. Um, and Hong Kong, uh, I think, is known for its free trade stance, uh, even though I'm not too sure if I'm a free trade defender. Now, um, what are the consequences are we? Uh, uh, partly the, the disappearing of this idea of greater China to me is because of the success of China. So, what's the big deal about Taiwan or Hong Kong? They might add somewhat to the overall economic strength of mainland China. You know, but China doesn't really need Hong Kong that much particularly economically, or Taiwan, since it has its own um, journal, journals and uh, other forms of economic interactions with the rest of the world. Um, and then it's already um, part of um, mainland China, even though under the one country, two systems arrangement. Um, well, Taiwan, for some time, had been a problematic issue politically. China and under the leadership of Chen shui and the DPP wasn't very keen about economic links uh, with the mainland as well. But with Ma ying and the uh, three links and all these developments uh, between mainland China and Taiwan, again, you know, that problem seems to be resolved. So um, what are we referring to now when we talk about greater China? And that sort of the, is uh, part of the issue that I've been thinking about. To what extent is you know, we still, you know, it's still a relevant idea, um, even though um, when I sort of think about, OK, we had a very interesting discussion on greater China uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, to what extent this uh, is returning? Or if greater China is returning, are we giving it a very different definition now? Well, this is really more or less about a much, much more powerful China returning to the global scene and then incorporating, in part, Hong Kong um, and even, to some extent, maybe particularly further down the road, uh, Taiwan. And so adding a strength uh, to a much more important uh, China driven primarily uh, through Beijing. Um, that conception of greater China might you know, be very different from the conception that uh, people discussed in the early 1990s. That conception of greater China driven from Beijing might go back to earlier times of the Chinese Empire, various you know, extensions of a very powerful China uh, into different parts of the world. Um, or are we talking about really basically still uh, a very dominant greater China incorporating Hong Kong, Taiwan, and then you know, having much, much stronger political economic influences over uh, neighboring areas. So there are sort of you know, different sort of ways and issues, and to what extent that new greater China um, would generate uh, potential uh, political tensions. Um, so this is really an extension of part of the 
China rise, China threat um, discourse. And uh, so greater China as an idea might come under that rather than the uh, earlier discussion on uh, greater China. Um, the earlier conception as explained uh, by Harding covers three themes, economic integration, cultural interaction, and political unification within the international Chinese community. Uh, it, economic integration uh, in part is the most straightforward. Um, this is another uh, Business Week article basically uh, revisiting the idea of Greater China um, a few years back um, by looking at how uh, China plus Taiwan, Hong Kong, primarily Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, would mean for China. Of course, that's a time when still there were all these speculations, projection to what extent, when is China going to be number two, when is China going to overtake the United States as number one economically. And even though China and Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan are not really you know, huge players, but already with a growing, more important, expanding Chinese economy, I think these two probably would help China uh, to inch its way uh, more quickly. So this sort of, you know, within this framework. So we do see um, even by 2002, uh, if we uh, look at um, uh, this kind of uh, greater China perspective, then we do have uh, China or greater China moving up very quickly, far earlier than what, of course, was projected. Of course, now we had uh, already uh, China itself becoming the second largest economy uh, in the world. Cultural interaction is far more complex. Uh, Stan is here. We know a lot about uh, the cultural dimension of China's political development. Um, if in earlier years there were some thinking about where would be the capital of greater China or economic greater China. In the early 90s, some people might try to champion Hong Kong or Shanghai, so it would not be necessarily uh, Beijing. Cultural interaction. Um, some people might say, oh, when, you th when we think about particularly traditional Chinese culture, maybe Taipei is a more logical capital for cultural. Uh, greater China. Uh, at one point, of course, because of all these migrants from Hong Kong and to some extent Taiwan going to Canada, my Canadian friends would say, no, Vancouver should be the cultural center for Greater China. I'm not too sure about that. Um, well, yeah, probably not LA. Yeah. San Francisco might have a claim. I'm not too sure. Um, and then the third political Reunification, obviously Beijing would be at the center of political greater China. Um, whether you're based in Hong Kong or Taiwan, of course, you know, politically, Beijing would be uh, at the center of all that. Um, economic developments, of course, you know, are now a bit different. Uh, Culturally, again, maybe it would be interesting to hear your views about you know, cultural dynamics. Politically, clearly, you know, Beijing continues to uh, be driving political developments, far more so after Hong Kong's uh, return to mainland China. Um, and, you know, we can again, perhaps, uh, discuss uh, mainland China, Taiwan, relations after the KMT uh, returned uh, to uh, rule Taiwan. Um, but we, if, uh, to what extent um, by 2010, 
Greek to China still makes sense even in, in the more sort of conventional uh, calculation of economic strength. Um, just sort of um, some sort of uh, quick uh, statistical compilation looking at some of this. China is already number two, so adding two actually doesn't make China number one. Still, China would be number two economy behind the United States. China actually is already number one in foreign exchange reserve. So adding the two, actually are both are sizable, both Hong Kong and Taiwan, sizable foreign exchange reserve. Um, China's uh, place as a destination of FDI actually goes up rather significantly by adding Hong Kong, uh, particular Hong Kong and to some extent Taiwan, uh, to the overall picture, and definitely an ex exporter. And um, in terms of land area, actually with Hong Kong and Taiwan adding to China, it would slightly etch out the United States. Uh, and then the United States would be number four uh, if uh, we use that kind of things to rank. Of course, the United States might also then try to add other places to its original, to its border, you know, Puerto Rico or some other places. Um, but this is uh, some of these you know, uh, figures about, you know, the difference between China and, and, and then uh, uh, greater China. Uh, this is GDP. Um, uh, using PPP. Uh, there are several, of course, all these different ways of calculating things. So this is just, you know, the IMF. Um, and then, uh, actually, Taiwan and Hong Kong are not um, ranked because, you know, uh, they're not considered to be uh, sovereign. Um, but um, uh, these are some of the figures. Um, so this is the GDP, uh, this is just, uh, that's GDP on using PPP, this is just GDP. Uh, and then um, in terms of trade, then uh, PLC sort of, you know, uh, moves up and um, FDI from reserve. Um, now, to what extent Greater China can now be redefined, particularly following this uh, signing of the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement uh, with Taiwan, and following, of course, also the so-called Close Economic Partnership Arrangement with Hong Kong, so ECFA and SIPA. SIPA, of course, was the first one de facto free trade agreement between mainland China and Hong Kong, signed in 2003. This is a live document uh, because it's sort of continuing with various supplements and expansion. Um, uh, once, of course, this term, close economic partnership arrangement, was used, um, it would not be possible to use the same um, description uh, for mainland China and Taiwan's uh, trade agreement. So something new has to be invented, and that's uh, ECFA. Um, and since there's an acronym for the Close Economic Partnership Arrangement in English, I think so that, that's also why there has to be something in English for this ECFA uh, arrangement. Now, my sort of um, uh, thinking is, well, with these two agreements, at least economically, it seems that all the basic sort of barriers and problems for further economic integration and some of the political barriers that has been standing in the way of closer cooperation and integration between China, uh, mainland China, Taiwan, and even to some extent Hong Kong. And initially, after 1997, uh, there was pretty um, different forms of resistance, of course, to some forms of uh, cooperation between mainland China and Hong Kong. And that partly explained why uh, some of those um, cross, so-called, in Hong Kong, the official term uh, for the dividing uh, line between mainland China and uh, Hong Kong is not border, 
so the politically correct way of describing that is boundary rather than border. And so we have cross-boundary trade and cross-boundary traffic in, of, in the official uh, government documents. Uh, but of course, you know, ordinary people do not always make that distinction. Now, uh, but there were issues earlier on, uh, the uh, discussions with Guangdong on some of the infrastructural developments between Hong Kong and the Pearl River Delta, I think, had uh, been rather difficult for some time. Um, and the first Chief Secretary of Hong Kong after 1997, uh, Mrs. Sanson Chan, uh, was known to be someone who uh, was very keen about um, the two systems rather than the one country side of the formula. So there were issues. Um, but then increasingly, of course, now the things have really changed. I still remember certain things which would be considered rather logical um, required really a lot of um, uh, discussions and uh, there were resistance within Hong Kong even for say opening up um, the um, checkpoints for 24 hours in the Hong Kong mainland boundary um, and there were a lot of people expressing all sorts of concerns you know why we should do that you know why 24 hours you know and various other you know tensions now of course things have changed um, some of these issues are no, no longer considered to be of you know, great importance, even though now there are other new issues like um, Chinese um, uh, women you know, crossing to Hong Kong and uh, giving birth in Hong Kong hospitals. Now there is a major political issue in Hong Kong that uh, Hong Kong mothers or mothers-to-be had problems you know, finding hospital beds because you know, they are overwhelmed by mainland mothers. I'm not too sure whether that actually was the case, but there was this sort of you know, perception and so a lot of political noises about all this. Uh, and then of course also the uh, mainlanders crossing into Hong Kong and basically buying up all the uh, baby meal powder in Hong Kong shops, uh, partly as a result of of course the tainted milk scandal earlier on. But anyway, uh, these are relatively uh, minor issues in the overall scheme of things. And we do have these two solid um, economic cooperation framework that seem to clear the way um, for perhaps the new greater China, far more powerful, incorporating these two smaller economies into the overall scheme of things. Um, uh, so we, we do see actually the deepening uh, of the economic integration uh, and more, more interactions uh, between Taiwan and mainland, even though I think there are uh, some of these you know, uh, different ways of looking at things. And this is the Taiwan uh, after ACFA. Uh, well, I guess some of these sentiments are probably always uh, there. Um, Hong Kong, of course, you know, benefited. At least the Hong Kong government have been insistent that uh, uh, the super uh, arrangement has benefited Hong Kong tremendously. Uh, it's very hard to come up with substantive figures. Um, there could be uh, some corporations that had been benefited. Uh, some of you here, I don't know whether your business connections with uh, Hong Kong or mainland China. Uh, perhaps the most important thing was actually Hong Kong corporations would then be allowed to operate more easily in mainland China. Whether they can make money or not, I think is a different issue, really depending on the individual corporations. And those who are successful probably are rather silent about you know, their success. Um, so we have a lot of complaints too about you know, not enough have been done. Um, uh, the single most important um, thing about SIPA and part of the SIPA arrangement is the um, scheme allowing so-called individual travelers to visit Hong Kong and millions of mainland tourists of course are spending money in Hong Kong and um, if you travel in Hong Kong and go to shops all these uh, fancy French uh, LV or whatever uh, trendy shops then um, 
if you don't speak uh, Mandarin, I think you'll be discriminated against probably. Uh, some Hong Kong person line up there probably would receive less attention uh, than those who are speaking in Mandarin because even the Hong Kong uh, might be trying to buy something, they would be uh, probably not as spending as much, so they receive, I think, less attention. So we do have these uh, Hong Kong zipper. Uh, we, we do, as a result, uh, perhaps not only because of zipper, but generally, I think the whole uh, developments of the economy uh, in mainland China. Um, these are the usual things that the Hong Kong government uh, would usually try to highlight about how important uh, the economic relations between Hong Kong and Chinese mainland has been. And also, um, why is Hong Kong such a wonderful place you know, for foreign investment and, and business uh, as a base for that business operation? Um, I don't know whether Zipper really make a decisive uh, change, but sim uh, uh, the symbolism, I think, probably uh, is rather important. Uh, but obviously, the deepening of the economic integration is very clear from all these figures. Um, uh, a lot of Hong Kong interests, of course, are operating in the mainland, and, and increasingly, it's sometimes difficult to differentiate between Hong Kong business interests and mainland business interests. A lot of mainland corporations, of course, operate out of Hong Kong, and uh, the flow of capital and, you know, uh, and, and, and trade and all that uh, in a more globalized context uh, makes it very difficult to differentiate things anyway, globally, not, to, not you know, simply in terms of Hong Kong and the mainland. But uh, overall, I think we can see how closely interacting uh, the mainland economy and the, and the Hong Kong economy uh, has been. Even though uh, Hong Kong manufacturers who have been key players in southern China and maybe in part Hong, uh, China's earlier stage of economic development, they are now facing really a very tough uh, environment, uh, partly because you know, of Guangdong province um, policies to restructure its economy to more service-oriented, high-tech-oriented, um, various more stringent labor laws, um, and then the hurdle for some of these Hong Kong manufacturers who are more used to exporting to other parts of the world than penetrating the domestic market uh, with a very different set of rules and uh, regulatory framework. So, so we do have a lot of you know, complaints and uh, uh, you know, it's some sort of Hong Kong business people you know, are quitting because you know, they feel that maybe it's no longer that profitable to operate uh, in the Pearl River Delta. So those, uh, some of them may feel that, okay, you know, uh, they make enough money, now it's time to you know, quit. But anyway, we do have um, huge um, economic interaction, uh, people traveling. Um, since 2003, you look at the latest figures, 2010 increased by 26.3% compared to 2009, 22.7 million mainland tourists going to Hong Kong. 60% of all tourists visiting Hong Kong. So huge numbers, and they're spending a lot of money. You know, 1,500 US. Um, actually, with this opening up of mainland tourists, uh, Taiwan uh, also you know, has been receiving a lot of uh, tourists. We had a interesting conversation during lunchtime and Clayton was showing us his wallet full of Roman B. And then he's now traveling in all these you know, different parts of greater China, I think, in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and mainland China, uh, without changing his Roman B. Uh, just use all, you can use a Roman B, I think, in some Hong Kong supermarkets and in Taiwan. I was there recently and, you know, I didn't expect all these shops in Shenkang, which is not even, you know, in central Taipei. Uh, to uh, you know, just uh, welcome uh, Roman B. Um, and then, last few days, I think we just had the announcement that there will be individual traveler scheme going to Taiwan. So we are talking about huge traffic, a lot of people. Anyone who goes to uh, the sort of uh, Law Wu in uh, Hong Kong, uh, 
and some of the other checkpoints, you know, just just stand there and look at the number of people back and forth. We can see these huge uh, numbers uh, traveling both ways, and you know, and not to mention various, you know, people coming in uh, by air and by sea. Um, having said all that, I would actually like to argue. In a way, the old conception of Greater China might still be relevant um, despite the incorporation of the Hong Kong economy and the importance of mainland travelers, for example, and actually, in a way, the importance of China's economic success for Hong Kong's economic future and success. Um, Hong Kong, I'm less familiar with Taiwan, but I, uh, in different ways, I think Taiwan continues by Hong Kong um, to um, present a different set of issues from Beijing's point of view, which are not, um, have not been um, sort of um, incorporated into a greater China framework from the Beijing sort of perspective. Um, just a couple of cases to illustrate my point rather than a very systematic review of the you know, political dynamics between the two. Um, this is Zhao Lianhai, um, who of course you know, uh, beca became an activist and organized the parents of children who suffered as a result of the uh, milk powder scandal in 2008. And then he became a political activist in 2010 he was sentenced to two and a half years imprisonment for disturbing social order. And that really triggered off a very widespread protest uh, movement in Hong Kong, uh, involving not only ordinary citizens, but the sort of the media coverage and the kind of you know, social um, uh, sort of disbelief um, about uh, how Zhao Lianhai was uh, treated um, had even forced some of those that we in Hong Kong would consider to be part of the political establishment more linked uh, to uh, Beijing uh, to be very critical of how uh, the Zhao Lanhai case was being handled by authorities in Beijing and various you know, petition and attempts by members of the, for example, the MPC delegates in Hong Kong um, to try to see whether the Beijing authorities could be a bit more flexible and you know, try, to, try to be more lenient towards Zhao Lanhai, uh, since he was also a victim of all that. Um, um, and more, more recently, uh, the case of Ai Weiwei, I think this probably is something some of you follow a bit more closely. Uh, Ai Weiwei, the famous artist, also the one who you know, helped design the uh, bird's nest uh, in, for the uh, Beijing Olympics, uh, detained when he was on his way to Hong Kong for uh, some activities. Um, and following his arrest, of course, there was a major international cry. But in Hong Kong itself, well, this is just you know, an example for those of you. I, I think most of you are familiar with his work, but you know, this is just one example of Ai Weiwei, uh, White House and Tiananmen Square. Um, so this is uh, posters calling for the release of Ai Weiwei, displayed in Chiam Sha Chui in Hong Kong. And various other things appear. Of course, this in part is linked to the new generation of what is known as the 80s generation or the opposed 80s, some of, you know, maybe there are a few of you, if you are you know, from Hong Kong, then you might belong to that generation. Um, having a very um, different uh, set of political ideas about how things should be run and managed in Hong Kong, have a very different set of perspectives on um, relationship between mainland and Hong Kong. They're not the ones who I think are necessarily um, uh, like the more old school uh, pro-democracy movement people. I think they, they politically, I think they, they probably had a very different set of ideas um, 
in terms of their perception of what's going on in mainland China. And they actually, you know, some of them probably, particularly if they're in the artistic community, they interact a lot with people in the mainland. So uh, it's complex. It's not just, you know, okay, we against you, but obviously uh, we have a very different set of uh, social cultural dynamics in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm not covering the, more the Taiwan side, uh, but Taiwan, maybe again, um, some of these, um, uh, this is one sort of artist in Hong Kong who has become famous by painting all these, you know, who's afraid of Ai Weiwei and, you know, um, and all that. Um, but uh, let me, uh, the Taiwan side, I'm not covering that, partly I'm not as knowledgeable about Taiwan. But I must also point out that it's interesting to uh, look at uh, at least, uh, say, economic relationship between Hong Kong and Taiwan. Most people assume that after the three links, Hong Kong's role as a middleman between mainland China and Taiwan would you know, be gone. And as a result, Hong Kong would be sort of more marginalized in the broader mainland Taiwan uh, economic relations. Uh, I'm not too sure in terms of uh, share of trade and economic relations, um, but in terms of actual growth, actually, mainland Hong Kong trade increased quite substan substantially. Bilateral trade um, in 2010, for example, increased by 27.3% over 2009. Taiwan still uh, a major trade partner uh, with uh, Hong Kong. Um, Taiwan actually is Hong Kong's uh, fourth largest trade partner after mainland China, US, and Japan. And then um, the same is true for Taiwan. Um, so the, the actually the, the, the figures of trade and economic relations uh, is very substantive. And investment, uh, uh, financial um, activities and banks. And the more interesting thing to me is actually the human movement and traffic. Uh, if we think of mainland as such an important source of tourists to Hong Kong, Taiwan is actually the second largest source of, Hong Kong, of visitors uh, to Hong Kong too. Uh, 2010, uh, Taiwan tourists uh, amounted to uh, 2.1 million. So it's also a very substantial number of Taiwan tourists who are going to Hong Kong, visiting Hong Kong, even after the three links have been established. And now there are so many flights between mainland China and Taiwan, and the business people go direct to the mainland for their business activities, perhaps with the exception of some of those who probably operate more in southern China, and maybe some of them still go through Hong Kong because of various other business reasons. Um, so we, we do see overall um, a thickening of these kind of human interactions, economic integration. But yet, at the same time, um, I would argue that if you look more closely about um, political dynamics uh, and the, 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 the new generation of people um, in Hong Kong, and I think they view mainland very differently. They're not necessarily hostile or some of the older generation in Hong Kong, of course, they could be extremely pro Beijing or they could be rather anti communist. I think the younger generation really is going beyond that uh, with a very different, more complex uh, appreciation and understanding of what's going on in the mainland and, 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 you know, and more traffic and interactions. But they're still different. And if we associate the old or the original concept of Greater China as one that is far more complex than simply economic integration, but a more dynamic set of interactions between all these places, which in some ways might extend China's influences and presence globally. But at the same time, it also posed uh, challenges and constrained mainland China in its operation internationally. Then perhaps um, the old concept of greater China is still relevant today. So thank you.